as we all know, food poverty is real. Eventually, there will be food shortage. We need to think a bit ahead. We need to think how to live sustainably. If we are shaping a garden, any green space, in a way where it benefits the people who are going to be enjoying it or the people that live near it, you are more likely to get those people to be involved. I would like to create a space for our local community, which is very diverse, full of people of colour. I'd like to create a sustainable space where we are growing sustainably. People can come in and say, oh, you know, I need two spring onions today for my dinner, and you can take it. My work is about building equity into the food system. My own personal experience of experiencing hunger due to poverty, due to austerity and not having enough money to eat and to feed my own children. Food justice just simply means giving people the choice to decide how their food is produced, where it comes from and what to eat. People in the community were given a hard deal because everywhere you look is fast food, off licenses, is betting shops, and we just said we need to be able to offer more to the community. People in the community are not being educated or given the knowledge about where they can actually grow sustainable food. We have issues of high food insecurity within these communities, lifestyle diseases, high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes, all related to diet. And that includes people who are food workers, farm workers and farmers. We came together with Humphrey Lloyd from Three Hairs Farm. Humphrey Lloyd said he wants to be able to be more involved with the community and to be able to bring more understanding of the community and farming together. If you your own the UK is the fourth richest country in the world, and yet now we have nearly four million people in food poverty. This is a slamming indictment of our food system. It's a slamming indictment of a market-based food system. The UK has cheaper food than anywhere else in the world, bar the US and Singapore. We also have cheaper food now than we've had at any time in human history. So it's not that our food is expensive. The problem, rather, is poverty. The UK has gone down a particularly hard line form of neoliberal development since the 1980s. We've then had 10 years of Tory austerity. The end result of this is that we have a substantial proportion of the population who can barely afford to eat. The Black and Green Ambassador Programme was set up in 2016 as a response to Bristol being named the European Green Capital. And there was a feeling in the city from its black and brown communities especially that there wasn't a diversity of voices around conversations about sustainability and environmentalism and justice. Nature makes us feel good. It makes us more creative, it restores us, it lowers our stress levels, our levels of cortisol drop when we're outdoors. So why doesn't everyone feel comfortable when they're outdoors? Is it just about how much time you spent there? And specifically for black and brown people. People from Africa taken to the Caribbean and South America and North America, people in Asia and other countries being colonized. So there's this long history of racial violence and trauma coming to England is seen as making it and leaving the land is seen as making it because of what's been associated with the land. But land never did anything wrong to us as black and people of colour. When you've come from a different country and you've moved here, you often actually have moved from a place where maybe You've been based in a rural location, maybe in a village. Maybe you've come from a family of farmers, and now you've moved here, and you're trying to make a quote unquote, a better life for yourself. And what does a better life often mean? It often means 
in 21st century to become more urbanized and actually to leave the countryside behind. Maybe that's sort of associated with being slightly backwards or dirty. If you your own time. Being a child of Jamaican parents, their generation, there was a lot of that sort of attitude towards growing that is seen as lesser. But in my generation, it's more of a aspirational thing where you just want to do for yourself. It's an addiction. It's the mental health benefits, the physical health benefits. My spiritual connection to growing, I just want fresh food. I want to know where it comes from. You could buy the exact same product, but when you taste it yourself, when you've just picked it off the ground, then you get to the plate, pot to the plate, you just can't beat it. It doesn't have to be big. If you don't have a garden, um, you could work on your windowsill, you could work on your balcony. Pretty easy to grow your own coriander. You just, you know, cut a little bit off and add it to your dish. You don't need to go to the large supermarket and rely on the large supermarket, which are, you know, they're pricey. The plastic pollution is ridiculous. I don't want to pay for plastic. I want to pay for my produce. I want it to be organic. And you could do that. You could do that, you know, create a community garden. We are trying to involve more and more people in so that when I'm gone, when I'm older, someone else would have the, the, the key to these gates. The children here would have that and they will carry that on. And it's about instilling that mentality in, in the whole community, especially people of color, that when we work together, when we unite, everything is brighter. There's more ideas to share. There's more roots. To, to put into the ground between us and why not let that be food? We all rely on food, we all rely on fruit and vegetables. It starts from the kid wanting to grow stuff, then the parent might set up a little something in the garden. People always use the excuse their ground can't grow on, but you can go and buy compost, you can go and buy soil. So you don't have to think on a big scale, like an allotment all the time. You can scale it all down but you've got to introduce that idea. You've got to plant that seed for when a person's young. Eating seasonally is very good. So for a large section of the year, you can live sustainably, where you can completely cut down on your bill of how much you would buy in a supermarket. But it's more than just the food that you eat, it's the actual physical side of it. And the mental well-being of being at the allotment. We know that we can't, you know, replace everything that we get in the supermarket with something that we can grow. Many people don't have any space, any outdoor space to grow anything. But what about communal spaces? How can we kind of bring those in, not just as a source of nutrients for our bodies, but a source of nutrients for our soul and our communities? And not just think about it just in terms of nutrition, but also how does it actually connect us up with our community? How does it connect us up with people we might not otherwise meet? So what are all those sort of co-benefits to be able to grow our own and grow locally and actually produce something that we feel is not just sort of a throwaway good, but is in fact part of how we nourish ourselves. So in this community garden in St. Paul's at the heart of Bristol, everything we plant is agreed on by the group. There's no leader, there's no, there's no hierarchy. We, we, we all decide on, you know, what shall we put in this bed? Let's all decide. It might take a bit longer to make that decision, but it's shaped by the community and it's for the community. And in the end, we would love to create a sustainable space where, you know, we're all enjoying it. We don't have to rely on supermarkets, cars and planes just to get me cherries or my herbs. It could be straight from the ground, from your own space. And, you know, it's very empowering to have that kind of space for yourself. Growing up, I wasn't a gardener. I just saw my parents doing it in our back garden. I, I don't know I had much interest, but I think subconsciously it was all in there. I've captured it all and I would say I was inspired by, by them as well to, to live sustainably. My parents don't buy herbs. They don't buy anything green. They get it from their garden. Just go out, get it, wash it, put it straight into your, into your pot. Well, my dad, he come from Jamaica. He was born in the uh, mid forties. So Jamaica at the time was quite a rural place and he actually, although he was born in a town in Kingston, their family moved into the country when they were quite young 
and that's from growing food, knowing different plants. So when they came to England, acquiring an allotment, it was just a natural thing. If you've got that ambition to have an allotment, you're pretty much in that sort of mindset of being environmentally friendly. Some research by the UK government into racial diversity and employment in the UK revealed that farming is the least racially diverse industry there is. And the second least diverse is the green sector, the environmental NGOs and the like. That is a slamming indictment of a movement supposedly trying to make the world a better place. For us working in sustainability and farming, we really need to engage different communities. We need to engage with racial diversity. I think there have been historically, people have had racist experiences when they've been outdoors in the British countryside, or they've been made to feel unwelcome. And then once people are carrying that inside, that sort of sense of not belonging, then it's very hard to kind of relax into an environment and feel restored by it if you're constantly sort of carrying that notion that this is not a place for you. So the more that people can both become comfortable in the outdoors, the more that we can also change society so that people feel welcome and belong in those areas, then the greater the benefits in terms of well-being and in terms of being connected to the earth, that can be shared amongst everybody, no matter what their background. Farming in the UK is probably the whitest profession with very few people of black and brown backgrounds actually farming. There's got to be a way of making sure that the poor can afford to eat, but farmers can afford to treat the soil well and, crucially, to pay themselves a living wage. Most food banks don't actually give out fresh produce. In the poorer neighbourhoods, that's what, exactly what they need. One of the other plot holders up here, he started a charity box where all the plot holders donate stuff which is excess to them, and he takes it to this food charity every week where they cook it fresh. But there should be a way of being able to connect people with getting fresh food, especially their children. Take out the fast food shops, take out off licenses and the betting shops and just replace them with organic shops, replace them with farming shops and actually link the green grocers which are already in the area and have an organic section that's from the farms, the local farms in the area, to be able to create more of a healthy option instead of fast food shops. And build trust with the community to be able to try out different cultures in the way they're cooking and teaching local people how to be able to cook cultural dishes with different chefs. So therefore, farm to plate cookery courses were created. So we had people from Somali trying out Cuban, we had people from India trying out Sri Lankan, we have Korean cuisine, we have Caribbean cuisine. Farm to plate cookery is actually taking local chefs and they're actually cooking their cultural dishes with organic produce from the farm. The alternative farming movement, really up until this point, has had its main focus on environmental sustainability, and for very good reasons. But it's really important that we also engage with social justice. That means getting our food products out to people that really need them, it means engaging people in food poverty, and it really means an overhaul of a totally unsustainable and unjust food system. We desperately need farmers and food activists to engage with this issue of food poverty and get healthy, nutritious food out to people who need it the most. I still remember the first time I came here and felt how isolated it felt because every day in the city, you just get used to the pavements and building, and just to be outside with the grass, the wind, the sunshine, the rain, because you're very exposed to the elements out here, it's a good feeling. Our current food system in the UK depends on food from elsewhere. We need to be producing more food and we need to be teaching 
all young people to do that, but more importantly, black and brown young people by teaching them about seed and about soil and how things grow and animal husbandry. We need to get them into agricultural colleges, but also just on land and learning how I learned from my elders, from my father, from people around me. We just need to get young people into nature. It's not just about giving land back to us as reparations, but it is about giving land back so that we can begin that healing. Once we create a model, once we work on this model that is from the ground up, from the people up, not top down, very much from the ground up, we could create little roots, we could make other green spaces around this urban area and especially green spaces for me, I think as we come out of the pandemic, is it will help everyone with their mental well-being, mental, physical, emotional, from the elderly to the children, it'll help everyone in society. It's, you know, we, we know that nature heals, um, everyone feels at peace in nature in one way or another, uh, whether you're doing the physical hard work or just sitting down in a garden and having a cup of tea. The world is too fast around you. This gives you a moment to slow down and really think about what's important and living sustainably is the way forward. As someone who was born here, who has children who are born here, I am daring to grow deep roots in the hearts of empire. Thank you.